All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so building on other things we've talked about today, I would like to, um, um, let's see, I would like to, uh, in this next section, discuss a little bit of the ways in which phylogenies, or estimates of the evolutionary relationships of groups of, of interest, um, can inform taxonomy and higher level classification and ultimately biodiversity and conservation. So, um, so I'm going to talk today about some fundamentals of interpreting phylogenies. Um, and from the poll that we took yesterday, I'm going to go through some, some, some basics of how we interpret evolutionary trees. I want to start by just reminding everyone of a couple things we've heard earlier and um, or to parts, parts of which uh, we've heard today. You know, this idea of systematics is this general study of the evolutionary relationships of organisms. And um, it's basically sort of composed of a couple different subfields. One is taxonomy, which is the science of classification and hierarchically organizing diversity, recognizing new species, naming taxa, all the stuff that we heard about earlier today. And then phylogenetic systematics, which is sometimes used interchangeably with the term cladistics, is that study of the relationships of, or the process of, of quote unquote, reconstructing evolutionary relationships of groups or estimating the genealogical or the, the evolutionary relationships among groups. And of course, that latter part depends heavily on trees, on use of evolutionary trees or phylogenetic trees for our, uh, the framework for our interpretation. And one of the things I'd like to get to at the end of my section today is how we might actually use phylogenetic trees as the framework for developing classification systems. And, um, and that's a little bit different than what we've heard about so far. So first, I want to just talk about the fundamentals of interpreting phylogenies. Um, and so just so that we, as we move on to this next section of using phylogenies for understanding diversity and classification, um, I want to um, just talk about how we interpret phylogenies so that we all know that we're on the same, we're on the same, um, what am I, on the same page or trying to understand it the same way. So um, here's just a, a, a graph of your typical evolutionary tree, right? This is the, the, the family tree that you might have seen in a National Geographic article or if you've read scientific literature that contains phylogenies. This is a, a topology or a, um, um, an arrangement of a number of taxa into an evolutionary branching diagram that tells us something about their hypothesized or in, in inferred evolutionary relationships among those groups. So the basics are pretty simple. We recognize the species as the entities at the tips of these trees, here at the tips, the distal ends of the phylogenies. And in this case, the species today that we've sampled are, are denoted by these different letters. And so I, again, I want to emphasize that this is now, we've interpreted, we've sampled these Let's just go with frogs. We've sampled these frogs, or whatever they are, that are represented by A, B, C, D in the current time. And then if we look back um, across the phylogeny, as we get deeper and deeper into this tree, you know, we start here at the tip and we get deeper and deeper into this evolutionary relationships, we're talking about inferring the past. So the current time scale is up at the top or at the tips of the trees, and the past is back in the, the base of the tree, if you want to think about it that way. So again, this is really how we, you know, how you can't go wrong if you just start with this very simple principle. Start at the tips and work your way back. In this case, start at the top and you work your way back into, down into the tree. But note that if the tree is tilted that way, then you start at the tips on the right hand side and work your way to the left going back. And if the tree is turned upside down, you start at the tips at the bottom and work your way up. Doesn't matter which way we represent the tree, which direction it's facing, you want to start at the tips of the pitchfork and work your way down into the base. So, let's just, um, so some, some basics about how we understand relationships and about how we understand um, the representation of species close relationships. So I'm going to ask you the question, um, are, D, are the species D and C, are those, do those look like each other's closest relatives to you and why? Those taxa, D and C. Anyone have a response for me? Some people are nodding. Yes, sir. Yeah, closer because they have the same roots. Okay, they're closer because they have the same roots, was the answer, which is right. They are closer to each other because they have the same root. They share this thing here. So we start at the tips. Can't move over there because I'll go off camera. Start at the tips. No, I can't, right? Start here at the tips and we on both sides and we work back. And when we work back, what we find is this point. And that's the ancestor of these two species. And with respect to all the other variation across this tree, those two species are each other's closest relatives because they share that point. They share that common ancestor there 
your, um, to the, to the, um, to the, what am I trying to say? They share that common ancestor to the exclusion of all the other taxa in the tree. So this thing over here, A, um, it, has, it has this big long branch between it and all the way up here till we get to C and D. But C and D are united by this very short branch to each other. So start at the tips, work your way back. How about F and B? These taxa are right here. They're right next to each other. Are they each other's closest relatives, right? They're sitting right next to each other. What do you think? I see someone shaking their head over here. I would say they're distant relatives. Distant relatives, right, exactly. These two are not each other's closest relatives, and this is a really important point. They sit next to each other, but they're not next to each other when it comes to the branch length that connects the taxa the species. They sit next to each other in space right here, but that space is arbitrary. What we're focused on is starting at the tips and working our way back through the tree. And we do that for B and C, and we find a common ancestor with a very short branch length connecting them. But if we take F and B, we go this long branch length all the way around the tree, all the way back up here, all the way back. It's a big long branch length. They're not each other's closest relatives. They're parts of two separate clades, um, or you might want to think of it as two separate genera. And even though they sit next to each other on the tree, in this representation, they are not each other's closest relatives. So that's a fundamental lesson when it comes to phylogenetic trees, is understanding that difference. And again, remembering, starting at the tips, work your way back into the tree. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some exercises here to tell you a little bit about tree shapes, characters on trees, and some terminology. And there's just no way to get around having to, to understand and learn this technical terminology. It's kind of a, um, some people are, are, are find it cumbersome, and it's sometimes it's kind of a turnoff for students, but it's only a couple definitions that you have to learn, and if you learn these terms, you can know your way around any tree and any higher level classification problem that you might try to solve with a phylogeny. So phylogenies come in, can be represented in any kind of shape. And again, it doesn't matter what the shape looks like as long as we remember that rule of starting at the tips and working our way back into the tree. So um, let's do this. If we were um, a biologist studying this group um, and we looked at the species F, E, D, and C and we decided that they look like they have um, some close proximity or some phenotypic or morphological similarity and we decided we want to put them into a higher level taxon like a genus and we named that genus Alphabeticus, and I just chose that arbitrarily because our species are letters here, right? I just said Alphabeticus is the name of the genus to make it sound like a genus. So if we chose those taxa, here's where their common ancestor maps onto the tree, right? Because if we take species F, E, D, C, all of these things join back to having a shared common ancestor at that point. And in this case, we would say that that genus Alphabeticus is monophyletic, and that's one of the terms you need to learn. It means monophyletic, means they come from a single common ancestor. They share a common ancestor to the exclusion of other things in the tree, namely these taxa. So if you were gonna name that genus monophyletic and, and you had a group of frogs in front of you, um, if you were gonna name it Alphabeticus, you would be doing the right thing because fundamental principles of, of higher level of, of phylogenetic taxonomy in general is we want our, gen, our higher level taxa like genera and families to be monophyletic groups. So here's our definition. A monophyletic taxon, like a genus or a family, is one of those higher level things that we can represent in the tree just like we have. It's one in which two things are really important and you gotta have both of these things to make it work. All of the members have a single common ancestor and B, all descendants of that ancestor are included in that taxon. So, let's look through this. Whoops, sorry, let's look through this. E, F, D, C, these all have a single common ancestor. We've named that node Alphabeticus, that place on the tree. They have a single common ancestor. They all come from the same place on the tree. And all of the descendants of that ancestor, all the things that arose from it, these branches, all of those ancestors, all the descendants of that ancestor are included in the genus. So the genus is Alphabeticus, and we've included F, E, D, and C. Those are all the descendants of that common ancestor. The common ancestor is that node we called um, the, the node here. This is where the, the, the genus maps onto the tree. And all of these are the things that descended from that ancestor, and they're all included. And so that's a monophyletic group. It all comes from a single common ancestor, and all the ancestors of that, all the descendants of that common ancestor are included. Okay, so if you have these two things, it's a, in general the principles are, this is the best way, the, the most sensible way to use 
what, what's known about evolution and the relationships of taxa to name higher level things like genera or families. Okay, here's another tree. And I'm gonna show you, should I get these curtains? Lights, nope, okay. Uh, here's another tree, I'm gonna show you another arrangement. Okay, so what if, um, um, let's see if I can do it here, here's a case. In contrast to a monophyletic taxon, like the one that I just showed you, a polyphyletic taxon is one in which um, its members stem from multiple different ancestors. So if you were the uh, biologist in this case and you decided that species E really looked more similar to species A and B, and you named those, those things A, B, and E as a new genus, that would be a polyphyletic taxon, a polyphyletic genus, because they stem from separate ancestors. They don't stem, stem from that single common ancestor. That's polyphyly, and that's a sort of a violation of the basic principles of that, that higher level taxa should be monophyletic units. All right? So monophyletic and polyphyletic. Those two are pretty straightforward. In this case, if you, name, if you were the biologist who named that genus Alphabeticus, it would be a, poly, a polyphyletic genus. It would be one that nests in two different places in the phylogeny. And that would violate our central principle that higher level taxa should be monophyletic units. Okay, let's keep going. Another one. A paraphyletic taxon, this is our third definition here, and if you get these three, you're in great shape. A paraphyletic taxon is one in, wi is one in which some, but not all of the descendants of that single common ancestor are included. So, if you were the biologist who named those three species as a separate genus, but you left out species C because it looked different to you, that would be a, polyphyl or a paraphyletic taxon. Because, again, we've talked about this again, so that, that thing out, that node that refers to alphabeticus would be paraphyletic because all these species, F, E, D, right, they all go back to the single common ancestor. That was A in our definition and our, our requirements, but not all of the descendants of that common ancestor are included, and that's a violation of B in our definition that we had before. Does everyone see that? So you can get a common ancestor in a paraphyletic taxon that makes perfect sense. They all go back to, track back to the single node, but not all of the descendants of that inferred ancestor, that node, are included. So in this case, C is a descendant of that node, but if you named these things as the genus Alphabeticus, C is left out. Everyone get it? We got a question over here. Question over there. Just maybe go back one slide and point out that polyphyly and paraphyly are not qualitatively different. Polyphyly, so right. A, B, and sure. E do track back to a right. This is a, this is a good point. Ancestor. The question of, you know, people often get a little confused when it comes to polyphyly and paraphyly because they seem to look like the same thing. Back here on the tree, here's a case where um, a, B, and E do track back to a common ancestor. That would be this point on the tree. And that could be viewed as sort of paraphyletic because it's D and C and E are left out. Sorry, F. Um, but it's basically the difference between paraphyletic and polyphyletic is the level at which we're addressing, uh, we're making a reference to a le certain level in the phylogeny. In this case, we were making a le reference to a deep level in the phylogeny. And these things um, came out in two different clades. And in this case, we're making a reference to a, a higher level, whoops, sorry, higher level in the phylogeny. Ah, what am I doing here? Lost it, there we go. Um, a higher level, which is just these taxa here, and C was left out, so that looks like a paraphyletic assemblage. So, that's a great point. If you get confused between paraphyly and, and polyphyly when you're looking at a clade like this, um, we're just, it's a, the difference is the level at which we're specifying in the phylogeny. Are we, are we making reference to a deep point in the phylogeny and that whole group, or are we making reference to a higher point? So hopefully some of this will become clearer as we move forward. There was another question, wasn't there? No? That was probably the same question. There is. If you can take it again, sorry, I got distracted by town trying to close the, <laughs> the cut-in. So ah, this town distracting. I, I, I think I understand, but I want to hear sure. it from you. So uh -huh. if you can't take it again. So just go through this again? Exactly. Okay. Sure, so I'm just gonna point from back here so we can continue our conversation. Um, let's, so we have, we've, we've shown an example of a monophyletic taxon where all the taxa, all these species, F, E, D, and C, they're all grouped into a higher taxon like a genus named Alphabeticus, and this genus has a single common ancestor, which is part A, all members have a single common ancestor, and 
all the descendants of that ancestor are included in the taxon. So here's the taxon, the single common ancestor, and all the descendants, all the things that are derived from that taxon, E, F, D, C, they're all included in the genus Alphabeticus. So those are the two things. They all have a single common ancestor, all the descendants of that ancestor are included. Now when you get down to a polyphyletic taxon, it's one in which its members um, stem from multiple different origins. And so in this tree, um, the group A and B are on one long branch and the species E is on another. So those have, they're in separate parts of the tree and to put them together would be a polyphyletic assemblage. Whereas a paraphyletic assemblage is demonstrated here higher up in the tree, which is sort of the same and it makes reference to the level in the phylogeny that you're talking about. But a paraphyletic assemblage is one that they all have a single common ancestor, but here C, C indicates not all of those descendants of that ancestor are included. Make sense? Yeah, all right. Okay, a paraphyletic taxon. I've taken a lot of, a lot of grousing from, from uh, town during this course, so I'm just gonna point out, is this a real, I mean, this all seems really abstract, right? Does this really happen in the real world? So here's a tree, as best we know, the, the evolutionary relationships between a group of taxa that are familiar to you, mammals, turtles, tuataras, lizards and snakes, crocodilians. What this looks like one taxon has been left out, right? If you recognized um, class Reptilia as this group over here, tra tracking back to this point in the tree, um, what species, what group has been left out? 